Okay, you can turn in your Bible this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Today's sermon is going to be how to get revenge. And people say, well, wait a second there. Revenge is not a Christian trait. That's not a trait that we Christians should have. Well, you're wrong. You're going to see that it is actually part of a real Christian life. But it's not the kind of revenge you're thinking of. All right. Now, while you're turning there, I just want to say that uh, thank you to everybody out there that was praying uh, for my trip out to Iowa to bring my bride back with me. We're back. She's sitting here beside me for the radio or the uh, listening audience that's not here and can't see things. And uh, next week is going to be our wedding, so please keep us in prayer. And I appreciate all that, but it was a very uh, hectic time getting everything together and stuff, and there's you know, a lot of emails that are unanswered right now just because things have been a little bit busy. So we have still have a lot of things to put away and whatever and get organized. So, But we're working on it. So please keep us in your prayers. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to start at verse 9. It says here, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. The Corinthian church was a very carnal church. And Paul was continually rebuking them for their carnality. And he's saying it would have been a waste of time if you would have been made sorry and not done anything about it. But they were made sorry and they repented. They changed direction. Okay, that's what what, what your word repentance means. Now look at the two types of, of repentance here. In verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know, there's a lot of people in the world, a lot of celebrities and things that are sorry for the life that they live and they'll commit suicide and whatever, but they're not sorry before God. That's a very important distinction. They don't care that they've offended God. They don't care about that. They just, oh, you know, I made a mess of my life. I got divorced. I, you know, drug addiction and whatever else. And, you know, I mean, like Whitney Houston, you know, for 10, 15 years living on drugs and alcohol. You know, why? She has sorrow. You don't need drugs and alcohol if you're in a good mood. Drugs and alcohol are, are to get you to forget your, your trouble. Okay? And I had a guy, you know, get mad at me because I said she's burning in hell right now. You know? How do you know she wasn't saved? Uh, you know, the fact that she was on drugs and alcohol for 10 years, you know? It's like, yeah, okay. But continuing, notice the godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. Now here's the proof that you re that these people repented. Verse 11, For behold the selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. <laughs> revenge is a sign of true repentance? Sure. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Did you know that you have to approve some things if you're born again? You don't just say, I'm a born again Christian, and then not offer any proof of it. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Mm -hmm. It says over there in, uh, what is it, Titus, I think? Titus 1.16. Yeah. You know, there are some things that have to change when you get saved. All right? But notice the list there. Carefulness is the first thing that's going to show up. You get saved, you repent after a godly manner, there's carefulness that you don't fall back into the sins of your past. What clearing of yourselves. You don't say, well, you know, I'm, I used to be a Satanist and then I got saved and now I still am a Satanist. No. You know, I used to be a Catholic and then I got saved and I'm still a Catholic. Uh-uh. You clear yourself. You get away from it. You forsake the sins of your past. Yea, what indignation... You know one of the first things that will hit you when you get saved? Is the fact of how much you were lied to in the past? Amen. How much you were deceived? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And you get and you get mad about it. You're like, I can't believe I fell for that. I can't believe that that preacher told me that the new versions are okay. Told me that the contemporary Christian rock music is okay. You know? It creates indignation. You develop a holy hatred for sin. What fear? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the past, you didn't fear God. 
You're up there in the sorrow of the world worketh death. These celebrities that, that you know, dope themselves to death or whatever or commit suicide, they don't fear God. You know, they say, hey, we're going to shoot a scene here next. It's going to be a love scene. You're going to have to take your clothes off. Somebody that fears God will say, no, I'm not going to do that. But somebody that doesn't have any fear of God, oh, sure, what, you know, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever it takes to make money and to be famous. See, they don't fear God. But after you get saved, you develop that holy fear of God. What vehement desire. And that one ties in real good with the next one. What zeal. Yep. You have a vehement desire to serve Jesus Christ and you develop a zeal to witness for Jesus Christ after you repent after a godly manner. But then look at the next one. Yea, what revenge. You know, one of the best things that happens when you sin, one of the best things that you can do is to get revenge on the one that caused you to sin. Who's that? Satan. And what Satan doesn't want you to do, he does not want you to read your Bible, he does not want you to pray, he does not want you to listen to the right kind of music, and he does not want you to expose his deeds. And the best thing that you can do as a Christian is to say, all right, you deceived me all those years, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to go and I'm going to tell people what you're doing. You know, I'm going to get revenge on you. But that's, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but we're actually going to talk here today mostly about when somebody wrongs you, how you can get revenge on them. And you say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, you're going to see that there is a biblical method for getting revenge on people. Okay? Stick with me. <laughs> I know this sounds bad, but stick with me. You'll see it doesn't it turns out in the end. First John chapter one. First John chapter one, verse six. You say, well then somebody that repents after a godly manner, they're sorry, they have all this good stuff, clearing of themselves and carefulness and indignation and all that, then they never sin again, right? Mm. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> Alright, it says here, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Okay, that's something that you have to remember there. It's not, well, you know, the blood of Jesus is kind of limited and, and, you know, it kind of covers some sins. You know, and other sins are, you know, you have venial sins and mortal sins, you know. That's a Catholic teaching. Sin is sin in God's sight. Now, there are certain sins that are more abominable. Yeah, sure. But the point is, as a Christian, God will forgive you for any sins that you commit. The blood of Jesus is there to cover those sins, to pay for those sins. But continuing here, verse 8 if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You say, well, I've been the, the second work of grace. I've been cleansed from sin. I don't sin anymore. Like the holy, holiness Nazarenes teach. That's nonsense. That's a lie. All right? You deceive yourself when you think that. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Wow. Isn't that something? For the holiness crowd out there, I am sinless. Okay? You're making God a liar. And his word, right here, King James Bible, has no part in your life. It's not in you. And you better read what Jesus said to the Pharisees because they were going around saying that they weren't sinned. And he says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Very dangerous to start saying that you're sinless. Jesus Christ was sinless. We're not. <laughs> all right? So the formula there that you see is, first of all, when you sin as a Christian, you do three things. Stop what you were doing. <laughs> okay? Repent. Turn from it. And, you know, the first one, stop it. Second one, repent before God. And third, the best thing that you can do is get revenge against Satan for tempting you to sin. Don't dwell on your sin. Don't, don't you know, agonize over it for weeks and weeks. Oh, I can't believe I failed. Oh, man, oh, man. How could God ever want me? Okay, you messed up. 
get it confessed before the Lord, forsake it, move forward, and get revenge on Satan for doing it, for tempting you to sin. But now what about when some lost person makes you mad? What do you do with that? Turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Could somebody shut that door going back to there? Second Timothy chapter two, we're going to look at verse twenty two. This is uh, Paul's uh, instructions here for this young man, Timothy, who's in ministry. And you're going to see some very, very interesting things here. Second T- Timothy chapter two, verse twenty two. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. I've talked about that before. You do not have to answer everybody. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You don't have to answer everybody out there. You know, Watch out for that whole thing. But look at verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That's very interesting. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Did you know that all sin is negative? There's no such thing as a sin that God rebukes in the Bible and says, "You're thou shalt not, you know, and, and it's good for you. You know, God doesn't say, thou shalt not live healthy. Thou shalt not get enough sleep. Thou shalt not eat vegetables or, you know, whatever. Ah, oh, doesn't say that. You know, thou shalt not eat, uh, drink raw milk. Now, I had to throw that in there. That's something that gets me irritated, but I'm not going to go off on a, st- a thing with that right now. But the point is, God does not take things away from you that are good for you. And when you see some guy and he's over there smoking, you say, you know what, you ought to get right with the Lord. Don't tell me, don't talk to me about that stuff. What's he doing? He's opposing himself. Cigarette smoking does not make you healthy. It destroys your health. You get some guy that's that's fornicating and, and watching pornographic movies and stuff all the time, eventually he's going to become a child molester or a rapist or something else. He's going to end up in jail. Okay, it's negative. And you go down through the list, you can look at every sin that's rebuked in Scripture. They're all negative for that person. And the people that are doing it, they are literally opposing themselves. They're hurting themselves. But what's it say there? That how, how are we supposed to handle those people? Go up to them and get in their face and scream at them, Repent! You know, is that what we're supposed to do? No. Gentle. Meekness. You know, there's a lot of the brethren that seem to miss this verse of scripture a lot of the brethren you know the the old flesh takes over and they like to scream and yell at people and you know a lot of the street preachers and and things you're not supposed to do that when you go to a gay pride rally if that's you feel the lord calls you to be to go to something like that you know go there and and read the scriptures to them don't stand there you know god hates fags fags are you know i mean all this stuff you're just trying to make them mad and then they get mad and they scream back at you and you go, I was rebuked for Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah, come on. You didn't do anything by being there. Well, I'm a prophet. I'm, I'm declaring their sin. Why don't you try to save them? You know? Why don't you come in meekness and gentleness? Oh, you know, well, that wouldn't be as exciting, I guess. You know, I couldn't go to prison for Jesus Christ, you know, and stand for my First Amendment rights. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's it kind of interesting because the Bible says about though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In 1 Corinthians 13, if you're out there in quote-unquote ministry and you don't have charity, you're, you're just wasting your time. And a lot of these street preachers, these militant, bold street preachers are going to get to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to be like, I'm here for my rewards. And the Lord's going to say, okay, here's a gold coin. Flip, you know, there you go. <laughs> Is this it? Is this all I'm getting? 
Yep. All that stuff down there was for your glorification. Mm-hmm. You didn't do anything. You know? It was an adrenaline rush for you. But now, you say, well, how's this revenge? What does this have to do with, re- with revenge? You know, how's this fit in? Turn to Proverbs chapter 25. Back to your Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 25. We're going to look at verse 21. You're going to see the very real tie-in here to the thing of, of coming to people in gentleness and meekness. You see, there's people out there, you know, the Bible talked about foolish and unlearned questions avoid. There's people out there that just, they know what makes you mad. And that's all that they're trying to do is, as the expression goes, get your goat. They just want to make you mad. But you see, if you come back to them in meekness and gentleness, well, that doesn't work for them. They want to make you mad. They want to get your blood pressure up. But if you come to them in meekness and gentleness and in charity and say, you know what, you can say what you want about me, but Jesus died for sinners and you're a sinner. And until you repent of that sin, you're going to go to hell. I don't want to see you going there. See, that that doesn't work for them because they want you to get mad. And I'll show you something interesting here. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 says here, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Huh. Did you know it's a difficult thing for your flesh when somebody's making fun of you, when they're making fun of the Bible, to respond to them in love and meekness and gentleness? Did you know that your flesh has a, has a nature in it that wants to, you know, wants to nail them? Yeah. Can't do that. Turn back to your New Testament, Romans chapter 12. You say, well, now that's Old Testament. You know, that's not for us today. It's Old Testament. Well, we'll see about that. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. I'm telling you right now, you know, I deal with I deal with some real nuts. <laughs> on on the internet and a lot of times my nature is just like they write me some stupid email and i'm just like okay you know i'm gonna nail them and a lot of times i've actually tried this thing of being meek and gentle and i'll actually win them over many times because they're expecting to make me mad and i come back to them in meekness and gentleness and in charity and they go oh wow you know kind of convicts them something to think about Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Seems like we just heard that someplace. You know, back in the Old Testament or something. You can't duck this one, brethren, cistern. (laughs) Okay? It's for New Testament Christians too. But notice it does not say, For in so doing, thou shalt show him love, and he will love you back. It doesn't say that. In context of this verse, it is saying, the best way to get revenge on somebody is to be nice to them. Isn't that interesting? You can actually get revenge. And the best way to do it is actually to be nice to that person, and it heaps coals of fire on their head. It'll make them matter. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say you should avoid revenge. It says, hey, let me tell you the best way to get them. You actually make them matter by being nice. Something to think about. So long as you don't take pleasure in them getting mad. (laughs) Well, you know, that might be a little difficult. Um, Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be back there to Romans chapter 12. I kind of skipped down a couple of verses there. People are probably going, why didn't he cover the verses above chapter, or verse 20? Well, we'll be back. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at uh, verse 6. Okay, it says here, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. You know, careful is kind of an interesting word. You know, I know Gail Ruplinger talked about this cognitive scaffolding, it's called. 
The definition of the word can be found in the word by breaking the word in half. Care, full. You're full of care. You are worried. Okay? It's kind of an interesting thing there. Be careful for nothing. Be worried about nothing. This would be another way to say it. But look at... Uh, and by the way, prayer and trusting God will stop your carefulness. Mm -hmm. Yep. You say, whatever you want, Lord. You know, that'll stop your worry, your carefulness. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, as a Christian, you ought to be calm and not worried about things. And the lost world should see that in you. You should be in control of yourself. And that goes back to the thing of being nice to, to your enemy, loving your enemy. When they come to you and they're mean and everything else, they should see a calmness in you that they're like, how can they take what I, all those abusive insults and everything? I don't understand that. You know, you should be able to have that peace that passes understanding that they can't get. Okay? And, and you say, well, then they'll learn to respect me and love me. Well, sometimes... Other times, it'll make them even madder. So you're getting revenge. You know? There's an old statement, the best revenge is living well. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know? People come, they want to discourage you. They want to stop you from doing what you're doing. They want to make you worried about things. The best thing that you can do is to show that you have a peace that passes their understanding. You have something that they don't have. You know, that's an important thing to remember. Look at verse 8. You say, well, how can I have the peace that passeth understanding? Well, here you have it. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, one of the, sometimes life can get very, very bad down here. The situation in America right now is not too good. What do you need to think about? All positive, lovely things, butterflies and flowers. Is that what it says? No. True. Is the truth always positive? No. But you need to filter your truth through the Word of God. You know, they say you get a president or some guy and he goes... We need to bring in the New World Order. Is that a good thing? No. But guess what the Bible says? The Bible says it's going to happen. So you say, okay, that thing I heard is negative, but the truth is God's Word says it's coming. Now, it's not good to dwell on that all day, you know, and think about things and stuff, and we're going to be talking about the our president, you know, whatever, the president, he's not my president, but the president... You know, his little statement about sodomites this past week. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But the point is, that's that's a negative thing. But it's predicted in Scripture. You know, the love of many shall wax cold. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I mean, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. I'm going to tie that into Bible prophecy here in just a little bit. But you see, true, honest, and just. Those aren't always positive. There are times that those are negative. But you need to look at those things in light of Scripture and say, this confirms my Bible. God's Word is truth. Okay? What about pure, lovely, good rep report, virtue, and praise? Sometimes it helps to, as they say, stop and smell the roses. Sometimes I just like to go outside and I just like to look at a flower. And just stand there and look at it for a while and just study the thing. And say, my God made that. That didn't come to pass by some random accident. And if my God made something so beautiful like that, what's heaven going to look like? And when somebody's an idiot and they're blaspheming God and whatever else, sometimes you need to think about those eternal things. Sometimes you need to think about, I'm saved, I'm on my, my way to heaven. You know, I'm going to be out of this filthy cesspool called earth at some point in time. And as you're doing that, you know, you can be sitting there, you know, and they're, they're blaspheming God and whatever, and you can just kind of, you know, think about heaven and stuff, and they're like, what's with this guy? <laughs> Can't get to him. Yeah. Why? Well, I'm not careful. 
I'm not worried about it. What you know, the worst thing that can happen to you as a Christian is death, and that takes you right to heaven. You know. Remember that. Well, I might be tortured for a while. Okay, then you get more rewards when you get to heaven. You know, they can't take your soul from you. They can't take your salvation from you. We have an eternity that's fixed in heaven. Eternally secure. But continuing here. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. We won't turn there, but it says, What shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, that's not a question saying, well, you know, nobody's going to be against us. It's just saying, hey, God's on our side. Don't worry about what people say. Don't worry and don't concern yourself about what the world thinks about you. All right? You're not going to fit into the world. You can't have both. Now, what about someone who is truly evil? I mean, somebody that is just, you can't get along with them. They don't want to hear about salvation. you got to live you know near them or work with them or you're related to them or whatever and they you just can't get anywhere with them all right what do you do with somebody like that romans chapter 12 we'll get back there now romans chapter 12 we're going to start at verse 17 i mean i'm talking a true enemy Somebody that's threatening your life, that, that wants to do you harm or something like that, that hates you and whatever. Look, we're going to see how to handle somebody like that, how to get revenge on somebody like that. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Notice it doesn't say recompense to no man, you know, uh, if he's coming and threatening you or something like that. It says evil for evil. If he's done evil to you, called you names or something like that, you don't go back to him. This is not saying that you don't have a right to shoot somebody. Right. You don't have a right to defend your family. Some guy comes and he's trying to hurt your family. That doesn't fall under this. All right. You have to defend your family. It's important to note that. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, if, a little another Bible if there, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. As much as lieth in you. As much as you can take it, you know. And I, I know that there are times when we get around relatives and things like that. And there are times I try to take it. And, and I sit there and take it and I take their stupid talk and everything and whatever. And around friends and stuff, we all deal with it, you know. And there are times I'm like, okay, that's about enough of that. I'm going to get up and go for a walk. Leave the room. You know? Just because you're to have charity and be gentle and meek doesn't mean you have to sit there and take it. You know? Keep that in mind. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now that might not seem like much, but it is. That's actually a very, very serious thing there. God is saying, hey, son, daughter, don't worry about getting that person that's, that's giving you trouble and it doesn't want to repent and everything else. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of them. Now, just think about this for a minute. Let's say somebody has wronged me, okay? And I got it in for them and I want to revenge myself on them. I have vengeance and wrath and all this stuff. And they know that. Now, I could go after them. They could flee to another state. They could go into hiding someplace. They could change their name or whatever else. Let's say I catch them. And I take them out back in some back alley and I beat them up and I break every bone in their body and stuff like that. Guess what? I go to jail. Was it worth it? No. Now, let's say about God. Where are they going to run from God? Nowhere. Nowhere. If you get in a situation where somebody's really giving you trouble and you say, God, please take care of the situation. God can do things to them that you can't even imagine. And I've seen situations, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, about turning somebody over to Satan. And we're going to talk about that. I've been wanting to cover this for a long time. There are situations where you can say, I've witnessed to this person, God, and they have rejected you. They have rejected your word. I've done my part. Now you do yours. 
and God will do things to them. I've seen families break up. I've seen people have heart attacks. I've seen all kinds of things because God turns them over to Satan. You see, Satan wants to destroy every Christian. And the only thing that, that stops him from doing it is God. God has restraint and says, no, don't touch him. You look back at the book of Job, God restrains Satan from messing with Job until Satan gets his permission. Satan is not some all-powerful being that can do what he wants and they're up there warring with each other. Uh -uh. He's in subjection to God. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But the point is, if you really truly want to take revenge on somebody that's really wronged you and they don't want anything to do with you and, and the Lord and everything, give them over to God. They can't run from Him. And there's no court in this world that is going to convict God. Not one. <laughs> He's above our court system. <clears throat> Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I mean, you, you want to talk about true revenge. You can get somebody to that point where they've rejected the Lord and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take vengeance on that person. <laughs> That's true revenge. You know, be nice to them at first, you know, be kind to them and whatever. But if they get to that point where God takes vengeance on them, He'll do a much better job than any of us can do. Let me tell you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. <clears throat> it says here, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You see the thing there? Mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's a court precedent right there. Verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Look at verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is long-suffering, God is merciful, God is patient. But there comes a point in time when God says, that's enough. Our God is also a consuming fire. Our God is also a consuming fire. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And there comes a point in time. I mean, you, you read some of the stories of Fox's Book of Martyrs, these guys that were torturing Christians. Some of those people died horrible, horrible deaths. I mean, terrible things. What was the one guy like... He rotted to death or something like that. Like his, his flesh was falling off of him and stuff. Just screaming in pain and agony. You say, oh, he tortured a lot of Christians. God got him. And there was <laughs> nothing that they could do for him. You know? I mean, there's the story of, of Voltaire, you know, that hated Christians and things. This great philosopher died screaming in pain and agony. Yeah. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7. Galatians chapter 6. A law of science. That's what we have here. Okay, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. When you put something into the ground, it will come up. Okay? When you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. All right? It will happen. And these people that go around all their lives mocking God and saying, oh, I'm getting away with it, I'm getting away with it. You know, I heard a good statement the one time. People say, you know, I knew a guy and he mocked God all of his life and drank and fornicated and smoked and whatever else. And he lived a good long life. You know, kind of like, oh, he got away with it or something. And I heard a guy say the one time, yeah, but God doesn't always settle accounts in this life. <laughs> Better think about that. And when the Bible talks about hell, weeping and wa weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, it's a terrible thing for God to just let a guy go and blaspheme him all of his life and then say at the end, 
guess what? I'm going to damn you to hell. And I'm going to laugh at you as you're going down in there screaming. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. These atheists and things people make fun of God, they're not getting away with it. And if God lets them go, that's actually a bad thing. Turn back to Isaiah in your Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 3. Speaking of the Sodomite agenda here, this is kind of an interesting thing. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. There's a lot of interesting scriptures, you know, where you have verses 9 through 11. No times, of course, because the verses, numbers were not inspired. You know. you know, not in the original. Yeah, okay. That's right, but this is superior to the original autographs. <clears throat> That's right, I said that. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Hmm. Interesting. We're going to get back to that in just a little bit. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They oppose themselves, like it says in Second Timothy chapter 2. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Okay? Remember, that you're supposed to dwell on things that are lovely and good report and everything else. And you'll have peace that passeth understanding. Verse 11. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. Hmm. They are reaping what they are sowing. Okay? Very interesting stuff there. <clears throat> and you say, well, show me an example of how God deals with a, or takes vengeance on something. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 25. Go back towards your New Testament a little bit, two books over. Ezekiel chapter 25. Ezekiel 25 verse 12 is where we're going to start. And you can read through the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and you'll see many parallels to modern-day America and where our country is currently headed. Okay? It says here in verse 12, Thus saith the Lord God, because, thou, or because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them, thus saith, therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger, and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Did you know God will use an army sometimes to come in and destroy a wicked nation? And there's a lot of people that talk about Russia and China and possibly invading the United States. And now, back then, you wanted to invade a country, you had to send in troops. You don't have to send in troops anymore. You can send in nuclear weapons, you can send in biological weapons, you can use weather modification type of stuff. There's all kinds of weapons nowadays. You say, well, God will protect us because we're God's nation. I don't know about that. And by the way, you know, well, we, ought to, we ought to, you know, stop nuclear weapons and stuff like that. I'm all for nuclear weapons. That's a quick way to go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, drop a nuke on America. Go ahead. Drop a couple, you know. <laughs> you know, you're gone with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Whatever. <laughs> you know? I'm all for weapons of mass destruction. I think it's great. Uh, <clears throat> just make them real good and big and make it quick. I don't want to suffer long. My flesh doesn't like suffering. <laughs> okay, sorry. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Notice, by the way, in both these passages that we're reading here, the people themselves are taking vengeance. And God's saying, okay, because you're doing that, I'm going to step in and take show you what real vengeance looks like. Verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out mine hand 
upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Cherethims and destroy the remnant of the sea coast, and I will ex execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Hmm. Rather interesting. When God takes vengeance, it, he does a much better job than the people. They see what real vengeance is all about. <clears throat> now, a little news article here. Remember, we read the thing about there earlier about the, they declare their sin as Sodom and they hide it not. Uh, of course, the big news headline this past week was Obama coming out and saying that uh, he's all for gay marriage and he thinks it's wonderful and all that other stuff. And uh, it's kind of interesting because what are they fighting for? They're fighting to get officially licensed, recognized state marriages, <laughs> which interestingly aren't even scriptural. So, you know, another issue. But uh, I have here an article. This is kind of interesting. This is from Fox News. I printed this uh, last week or so. Or no, I guess this was in April, April 23rd, uh, 2012, by Todd Starnes. It says here, proposed law would force churches to host gay weddings. Religious liberty groups are blasting a proposed ordinance that would force churches in Hutchinson, Kansas, to rent their facilities for gay weddings and gay parties. The Hutchinson City Council will consider adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the protected classes in the city's human relations code. They are expected to vote on the changes next month. According to the Hutchinson Human Relations Commission, Churches that rent out their buildings to the general public would not be allowed to discriminate against a gay couple who want to rent the building for a party. Merrill Dye, a spokesperson for the Human Relations Commission, confirmed to Fox News that church, churches would be subjected to portions of the proposed law. They would not be able to discriminate against gay and lesbian or transgender individuals, Dye said. That type of protection parallels to what you find in race discrimination. If a church provides lodging or rents a facility... They could not discriminate based on race. It's along that kind of thinking. Okay? That's what they're trying to get through down there. Matthew Staver, chairman of the Liberty Council Action, told Fox News the proposed law is un-American. It is a collision course between religious freedom and the LGBT agenda, Staver said. This proposed legislation will ultimately override the religious freedom that is protected under the First Amendment. I'll get back to that in a minute. He argued that churches cannot be forced by the government to set aside their religious convictions and their mission, and he warned some churches could even be forced to rent their buildings for drag parties. What we are ultimately going to see is churches forced to confront this law, forced to do things and allow their facilities to be used by people, and for events that diametri diametrically undercut the mission of the church, he said. Now, I'm going to give you a little prophecy. Okay? You say, oh, despise not prophesying. Okay, here we go. You are going to see churches being forced to perform gay weddings. You say, but that's a violation of the First Amendment. Hate to tell you, but in 1966, with the passing of 501c3, they gave up their First Amendment right. You know, we can't see governments, you know, forcing churches. Oh, yeah, you can. They're government facilities. And what they did is they said, we want to be able to write off our, our giving, you know, on our taxes, so we'll accept this classification with the IRS and we will give up our First Amendment right. And for years and years, you had these preachers, the 501c3 preachers saying, it's not a big deal, we get to preach what we want to preach. That's coming to an end. And I'm going to tell you, and I've been saying this, you're seeing it more and more, the Second Amendment is being taken away from these 501c3 churches, and the First Amendment is being taken away. And you're going to see... Now that the churches have been eased into this whole thing and they feel comfortable with 501c3, you're going to see the government start to squeeze these churches and say, you will do this, you will do that, or we're going to shut you down. And now you're going to start to see the separation of the men and the boys, so to speak. <laughs> you're going to see 501c3 churches falling. All right, I've been seeing it. It's not some kind of a wild vision I had last night or something like that. It's based on science. It's based on seeing article after article after article of these government churches losing their rights and starting to be forced. And they're all like, well, they're going to take away our First Amendment right. You already gave it up. 
And you're going to see more and more churches folding. Or sadly, I think a lot of them are going to compromise. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the sad part. Yes. Well, you know, our ministry here isn't so much about, you know, being against sodomy. I mean, if we have to, you know, do a sodomite marriage occasionally, it's about winning souls to Jesus Christ. I mean, we, you know, we just got to compromise. You know, if we can't carry guns to church, well, you know, okay, but it's, you know, it's about winning souls. I mean, uh, uh, yep. Yep. It's a business. That's what corporations are. You're going to see less and less Bible-believing churches out there standing uncompromisingly for the Word of God. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Now, a couple more things I want to hit here. What about a saved Christian who is wronging you? Okay, Somebody who's lost that's wronging you, come to them in meekness and gentleness and try to be loving towards them, You know, actually heaping coals of fire on their head. But what happens when you actually have another Christian who is wronging you? What do you do with somebody like that? You can't have God condemn them to hell. You know, what do you do? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Back to the New Testament. Now this is an interesting thing here. You want to talk about a Christian that's messing around in sin. This guy here is one of the worst. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Okay? It says here, it is reported commonly. In other words, everybody knew about it. This wasn't just some kind of secret thing that was going on behind closed doors. It was reported commonly. It's being talked about. The gossip of the town there in Corinth. You hear about the church down there, you know, First Baptist Church or whatever. <laughs> you know? I've got to pick on the Baptists. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. What an abomination. And I don't know, it doesn't specify clearly if that was his birth mother or like a stepmother or something. Either way, it's very, very wicked. Okay, it's a big problem. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. I wonder why they didn't uh, kick him out. Do you reckon maybe it was because uh, they were the biggest givers? They had the most money? Reputable family? Wow, you know. I don't really agree with it, but I mean, they are good people after all. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And Paul's going, I don't even need to be there. Mm-hmm. I don't need to know the family. It's wrong. It's sin. I don't, need, I, don't, I don't need to know the details. I don't want to know the details. It's sin. You know? Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ... I mean, he's throwing around the full title there. He's not fooling around. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. How do you know that this guy was saved? Right there. The spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This guy was a professing Christian. And yet he was doing this vile sin. And what did Paul say? He didn't say, well, you know, we'll just kind of We'll just kind of speak to him, you know, in private, and you know, kind of send him away for a little bit or so. He said, "Hey, let's just deliver this guy to Satan. Let's pray to the Lord and say, Lord, this guy's wicked. This guy's evil. Just unleash Satan on him. You know, give him a, a disease or something like that, or just kill him. You know, that's what's going on there. And you might run into a Christian that is just completely carnal, wicked, evil, and the best thing that you can do." is witness to them, and if they don't hear it, just say, I did my part, Lord. You know? Do they come along and they say, you know, I don't know if I agree with the King James Bible. Okay, say, okay, what is the Word of God? What's the perfect Word of God? Well, you know, I mean, I had a guy this one time, and he said, he said, well, you know, you have to remember it's written by man. I said, okay, then God's Word does not exist in a perfect form? And he said, no such book exists. That's what he said to me, professing Christian. Now, what he's done there, he has declared before God and before man 
that God's word is a lie. Now guess what happens at that point in time? I have actually taken the greatest revenge that I can on that man by getting him to deny the truth before God. Okay? At that point, God says, you're no longer innocent. The truth has been presented to you by one of my saints down there. You're one of my saints too. But now I have no reason to restrain Satan on you. Satan? Hey, see that guy down there? Go ahead. Have at it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a couple of those where the Lord just unleashes Satan. And their families fall apart. They get health problems, all kinds of stuff. You deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? Or how? By bringing the truth to them and getting them to reject the truth. And I didn't do it in malice. I, didn't, I wasn't like, I'm going to try to trick this guy with word games so I can get God to destroy him. You know, That wasn't it. I just put him into a position where I got him, I told him the truth, and he rejected, and I said, okay, Lord, hands off. I'm not going to sit around and argue with this guy. He's rejected the truth. I'm not going to try and just pound him and pound him and pound him in documentation and facts. Hey, I presented it. He rejected it before God. That's it. Hands off. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. And this is kind of an interesting theory, uh, thing here. If you want to live for Satan as a Christian, you will die just like a lost person. Okay? You are saved if we say that we uh, are without sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. You know? You're going to sin, but the, the idea as a Christian is to sin as little as you have to. And to forsake it, you know, confess it, forsake it, move forward. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. You know, I've heard, a guy, I've heard Christians say, well, I'm not a saint, but... Uh, Blah, blah, blah. You better be a saint. You better live like a saint. As a Christian, you are called to a higher standard. Continuing. Verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now let me just stop there for just a second. That doesn't mean you can't ever tell a joke or you can't ever laugh. Okay, It's just simply saying, the Bible is simply saying that you shouldn't just be never talking about Scripture. You should, you know, your conversation should be in heaven. You know, heavenly things, focused on heavenly things. I think we'll say one point here. Again, English. God's word in English. The yeah. word nor is used. Mm -hmm. no, nor, nor would be... Uh, kind of combining those things together. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting. You're combining those things together. Yeah. So. Yep. Anyway. And it's interesting because a lot of times jesting and foolish talking can become quite filthy. Yeah. Even among Bible-believing Christians, I've you, seen that. Always, I probably shouldn't tell the joke here, but let me just say this quick. Uh, you always say that. You've said it many times where there's that progression Yep. You open up the can of worms and it just starts to get a little worse and a little worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Lost people. Look at verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Okay? You can be punished along with the lost world. All right. Once you get saved, you still have the ability in your flesh to do all the sins that the lost world does. Your eternal, eternal destination is fixed in heaven, but you can still be judged according to the flesh, according to what you're doing. God's going to deal with you as a son or a daughter, but you're still, you know, you're not above punishment. All right. Just a couple of things here. How about covetousness, which we just read about there? You say, I, you know. Oh, maybe a little bit isn't that bad. Well, you'll never you'll never be satisfied with anything in life. 
if you mess around with covetousness. Drunkenness, what's that lead to? Health problems and lost money. How about cigarettes, cancer, emphysema, and more lost money? These things are expensive. How about sex perversion? You know, like the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What was going on there? Well, you get uh, VD, AIDS, STDs, and not knowing true love of one partner. Right. You know? How about the wrong music? Well, you have the elevation of the flesh and destruction of your hearing. Isn't it interesting that, that a lot of times the fleshly based music, rock and roll, rap, and even, you know, modern country music, which is basically just rock with a steel guitar, <laughs> you know? Isn't it interesting that most people play it loud? Very loud. You hear them going down the street, you can hear them a mile off. What are they doing? They're destroying their hearing. It's not good for you. Uh, TV. Television puts images in your mind and eventually memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. There have been studies on that. Yeah. University studies. The flicker rate and everything and the flash rate and that constant just bombardment with images can lead to Alzheimer's. Watch out for that. Let alone adrenal fatigue. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff there. And the whole thing is, if you mess with sin, sin will eventually mess with you. It'll destroy you. All right? First Timothy chapter 1. I'll turn here yet, and then we will be done for this morning. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. See here another example of two Christians, which uh, Paul turned over to the to Satan. First Timothy chapter one verse nineteen, mm -hmm. holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Do you ever see a picture of a shipwreck? You know. You got this boat and it's smashed on the rocks and stuff and there's little pieces floating away in the ocean and everything. That's a mess. Do you know you can make a mess of your life as a Christian? You start messing around with sin, you start forsaking the Bible, forsaking prayer, listening to the wrong kind of music, watching the wrong kind of things, you can make a shipwreck out of your life. And at that point in time, a lot of times God will say, okay, Satan, go on in there. Have a field day. That's a bad thing. But as Christians, we don't have to live like that. And, you know, when you're dealing with saved sinners, just to kind of recap here, when you're dealing with saved sinners, first of all, preach the truth to them. All right? If they reject the truth and openly reject it, and it's not a matter of, you know, some of them, they'll just say, well, I don't know. I never heard any of this stuff before. I, you know, I need to pray about this or whatever. That's not really rejecting the truth. It's just saying they want to study it more. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? But if you have somebody that knows the other side, like these people that study the King James only movement and they actually attack back, I just step back and say, okay, I warned them. Go ahead, Lord, deal with them. You know? And I'll tell you right now, you start messing around with that new version of philosophy, God will turn Satan loose on you. And your life will be shipwrecked. All right? God's not going to bless a person that goes around saying that there is no perfect Bible. It's lost in the manuscript somewhere. We don't really know where it is. God's not going to use you. Okay, You will make shipwreck of your life. What about lost sinners? Well, show them love by witnessing to them. And that's actually the best revenge that you can get on them. If they reject Jesus, God will take vengeance on them. He will recompense to them, and He'll do a much better job than anything you could imagine. You know, I know a buddy of mine right now is having trouble in the neighborhood that he lives in these parents are not taking care of their kids and the kids are running around in his flower beds and stuff and knocking things over and whatever little kids you know and and we were talking and we started getting a little bit fleshly you know and coming up with ideas to keep his kids out you know <laughs> and it's just like okay but if we would do some of that stuff we'd probably end up in jail we'd be in trouble we'd get sued or something like that the best thing that you can do is turn them over to god Okay, somebody comes after you and they don't want to repent and they, they just keep coming at you even though you're nice to them and do nice things for them, 
Just step back and say, God, get these people off my back. And then you let God take care of the situation. And when you let God, when you get into that situation, you will be surprised sometimes how God will take revenge. Okay? So that's going to be it for this morning. I guess we're going to close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I um, thank You for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, that You are there to protect us. You're not just up there letting us face everything down here by ourselves and, and we're just helpless down here. And and you're, a, you're not a bad father, Lord, that just forsakes His children. You're watching. You know what's going on. But Lord, I just pray for strength for everybody here this morning and also for those that are listening on the recording. Give us strength, Lord, to, to be long-suffering and to be meek and gentle in our dealings with the lost world. Uh, help us not to be quick to be angry and, and to let the people get us. Give us that peace that passeth, passeth all understanding. And um, Lord, this country in America, and I know there's a lot of people that listen around the world, in the UK and in Australia and, and a lot of other people out there in other countries, and none of us can really say that we have a God-fearing nation anymore. Uh, there are places that are varying in degrees of wickedness and it's just so vexing, Lord, being in this world. And I pray for your soon return. I pray that you would catch us away from this place. And then, Lord, I know that your wrath and your vengeance is going to be poured out for seven years. And it's going to be the worst time that this world has ever seen. And I understand that, Lord. I don't, I don't view that as some kind of a thing where you're bad or whatever. I know why you're going to judge this world in vengeance and wrath very soon. And uh, But, Lord, I pray that in the time that we have left, that we would live as shining lights in a very dark world and that people would see that we have that peace that passeth all understanding. And uh, so I guess I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.